Welcome back to unit four. This is video 4.2. Um, we are talking about logs. And so just to recall, uh, th these are those same properties of exponents. And I'll show this every time because this is something that should be drilled into your head. This is something you should absolutely know. It shouldn't be a property that you are struggling to recall at this point. I'm hoping you memorize these. Okay. Um, so a log is simply the inverse of an exponent. That is what a log is. It is the inverse of the exponential function. Okay. Um, so when we see this, and here, here is that graphical depiction of an inverse, right? Because it's over y equals x. It has that symmetry. But when we see this, we can actually look at it and relate their form. So here we have the logarithmic form on the left. So this is log base b of x is equal to y versus our exponential form, which is b to the y equals x. But why are they related? Now, why did I color code them, right? So my bases. Okay, they actually stay the same. That's what those that relation is. So log base b, um, that is the base of my exponential form. But my exponent is what my log is going to be equal to because think they are um, inverses. So you're literally just switching their y and their x. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, work on some example problems together. So here I have my first one. So again, if I recall that this is my base right here and it's technically equal to some variable. So let's just say that it's equal to y, and that is my exponent. So then I can rewrite that. How do I solve? I can rewrite that using the exponential uh, inverse, I guess you could call that. So three to the y would actually be equal to 81. So then I can actually solve this. What power up here would solve this equation? Well, three to the fourth would equal 81. Therefore, your y equals four, and that would be our end solve. So let's see another one. Okay, here again, this is my base, and this is equal to my exponent. So five to some exponent, some exponent, let's put that as a capital E, is equal to the square root of five. Well, this one's a little harder, but this one has you remembering that exponent property, which is why I stressed that on the previous couple slides, that exponent property of x to the a over b is equal to x to the a b. And so what would be the square root of five? Well, that's five to the first power, and there's technically a little two out front. So let's convert that back. That's five to the one half. Therefore, look at that. If that equals that right here on the right-hand side, then what is e going to equal here? That means 5 to the one-half is equal to the square root of 5. Therefore, my exponent was equal to one-half. Let's try another one. Now here we get an even more complicated one. So this is saying my base of 7 to some exponent is equal to 1 over 49. Well, what's the relationship from 7 to 49? Well, we know that 7 squared is equal to 49, but how do I get it to look like 1 over? Oh, wait. If I just want to flip it from the numerator to the denominator, isn't that a negative exponent? So again, we are tying back in all those exponent properties that I showed you on that very first slide. You need to have these memorized. You need to understand them completely because without them, you're going to struggle in this unit. So 7 to the negative 2 would be equal to 1 over 49. Therefore, my, my y is equal to or x is equal to negative 2. Okay, so... I've got a final one for myself. So here, 2 to some power is equal to 2. Well, anything to the first power has to be equal to itself. Therefore, x must equal 1. Now, I did a few of them, and I've got a few for you, and I really hope you do pause and try to solve these. So here's my first one, and I'll help you set it up. 8 to the what would be equal to 5, 12. Okay, here's my next one. Here's the third one. And I think that's it. There might be a fourth. Okay, that's it. So let's talk about some properties of logs. Um, log of one is going to be equal to zero. That's something to just memorize. But log base b of b is equal to one. So that just means so log base 10 of 10 would be equal to one. Log base seven of seven is equal to one. Because think about what that means. You're saying 10 to the what is equal to 10. Seven to the what is equal to seven. And so we always know that that's going to be to uh, the first power to get that answer back. Okay, here log base b of b to the x is equal to x. So think about what that's saying. So log base 7 of 7 to the x is equal to x. Well, let's test that out. 7 to the to the x is equal to 7 to the x. Heck yeah, it is. So that means x is equal to 
X, heck yeah, it is. So that's just proof that that, that that exists, right? So, I mean, that's just, these are literally properties that come from that relationship between the inverse, the log and and, and exponent, which is that they are inverses. And finally, if I raise a base to the power log with the same base of X, then we can cross all of this out and be left with just that X. So, here are our two examples that I'm going to do for you, which involve these properties. So log base 5. I could write that as 5 to the what is equal to 125. I sure could. But I could also see this as log of 5 of 5 cubed. 125 is the same as seeing that as 5 cubed. So that's a property right there. Log base base, base, base. They're the same. So I can just cross all this out and just be left with 3. Yeah, that's what that is. It's equal to 3. Heck yeah. Okay. So now what about this? Again, we have the same base, the same base here. So I'm going to cross all this out. And what was I left with? 4.7 is my answer. So I'm hoping you can do this same concept and practice right here. What's another way you can write 81? And I'll give you a hint. It has to do with 9. Can you try it? All right, here's my next one. Check out your bases. What are you allowed to do? Fantastic. So moving on, let's talk about some other common logs. Okay, log of 1 is 0, we knew. But what base do we assume if no base is provided? We assume a base of 10. So just know that. If there's no base provided, you always know it's base 10. So log base 10 has to be equal to 1 because it's log base 10 of 10. Log base 10 to the x has to be equal to x because it's log base 10 of 10 to the x. Therefore, you can cross all that out. And finally, 10 to the log x is equal to x because, again, that's that assuming base of 10. So these are just common logs dealing with 10 because you can assume a base of 10. So let's look at this. What is my assumed base? Because I've been yelling it in your face. It's 10, right? So that's technically 10 to the what is equal to 0 0.001. And this is where I would remind you from science class, did we not use scientific notation? And what does scientific notation tell me? Well, I can take this and move it and I could get back to my zero, right? I get, I'm sorry, I get back to 10. But how many times did I move it? I moved it four times in the negative direction. Therefore, what do you think? Um, did I move it four? Oops, sorry, only one, only three, sorry. There's no number over here, so I moved it three times in the negative direction. Therefore, it is three, but it's not just a positive three, it is a negative three. So this is the same as saying uh, log to the 10 to the negative three is equal to, and that's what that's equal to. Look at this one. What's my technical base here? 10. So that means if this matches this, I can cross all that out. And the only number I'm left with is 5. Okay, here we have another. Again, this is log base of 10. Uh, this one, I would... There's nothing I could do, right? 10 to the what is equal to 26. Well, there's no relationship. I can't move a decimal. Um, there's nothing I could really do with this. This is a calculator question. I plug log of 26 into a calculator, and I should get approximately 1.42. All right, and finally, we have log of negative 5. Okay, this is one that you're just going to have to memorize. What's important about this question is that it is a negative number within the parameter. I can have a negative outside of a log. That's allowed. However, if negative is within my parameter, we say that it is undefined because the function of log is only defined when x is greater than 0. Therefore, if you have a negative number in here, we call this an undefined point. And you can look at a graph. No values exist when x is uh negative on a standard log function. So here I have a couple for you to do. This I'm going to remind you, this has to do with scientific notation. Can you rewrite that in its scientific notation? You will be able to answer this question. I've got another couple for you. Again, what's the natural base of this question? Okay, and finally, let's talk about natural logs. So we have something called a log. We also have something called a natural log, which is related to our natural base. And what is our natural base? Our natural base is E. So we write natural log as LN. I know you guys might want to write it as NL, but this is standard notation, so we write it as LN. So LN of 1 is equal to 0. Where have we seen that before? Isn't log of 1 also equal to 0? So this is something to just memorize. LN of 1 and log of 1 are just 0. But what is LN of E? Think about what happened when we took log of 10. Well, what is was my base? My base is 10, therefore it had to be equal to 1. But what is LN of E? Well, what's the base of natural log? 
Guess what, guys? It's E. Therefore, E to the E has to be 1. Okay? So then here we have ln of E to the X. Again, let's look at that with the natural base. What's happening here? I can cross all that out. I'm only left with X. And finally, E to the ln. Again, here's another base of X. Base, base, I can cross that out, and I'm left with X. There's the proof behind those natural logs. Now let's actually apply some logarithmic properties. Not necessarily these, but just in general. So here we have the ln of e to the e to the sorry e to the 0 0.73. But again, if I know my natural base right here, I know that all of this is going to cross out. So my only answer is going to be 0. Point, oops, sorry, 73. Next we have ln of negative 5. Well, if log of negative 5 was undefined, what do you think ln of negative 5 is going to be? If you guessed it, you were right. It is undefined. Always negative numbers and ln and logs, they don't match up. Okay, here we have ln of 32. Well, when we did the log of 26, the base 10 didn't help us. We had to plug it into a calculator. So the ln of e to the 32, what do you think? Is that e going to help us? Not quite. So, oh, this, sorry, this was a you do, but there's my hint for you. What do you think you're going to plug that into to get this answer? Here we have another you do, and my hint is remember what the natural base of ln is. Okay, but how do I graph those logs? Now we talked about all their properties. Now we have to graph and figure out their transformations. So how do I graph them? The same way we did with exponentials. You're going to plug it into a table, plot it out, and predict its key features. Okay, so there we go. Create a table, plot your points, identify, and there you go. So here's my I do. I'm going to graph log base 3 of x. Now... This is something you're going to use a calculator for, and this is the part that I know kids struggle with, is finding it on the TI Inspire. So here is the button you're going to be using. It's above the 10 to the X button, but as you can see, it's written in a different color. It's whatever color your control button is. On mine, it's, a, it's blue. On some, they're yellow. I don't know. It just depends on what color your TI Inspire is. So here's that control button you're actually going to hit first. So you hit control, you hit your log button, and you should arrive with a, with a box that looks like this. If you don't put anything in the base, it's going to assume base 10. Okay, But I went ahead and put log base 3 of 0 0.01, and I got my first number. And here is uh, the graph that I ended up, or the table I ended up charting out, and here are my answers. Okay, So let's plug those points in. Color-coded, here we go. There's point, a point, a point, point. Point, and I'm actually not even going to be able to graph that last point um, all the way out there. But if I connected my little dots, I can see, I can actually kind of predict what's going to happen with this graph. But to make things cleaner, I have a graph ready for us. So we're answering these questions right here. What is my domain, my range, blah, blah, blah. So where does my domain start? Well, with exponents, my domain started all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity. But with logs, this is our inverse. So it's actually starting, you can see, at 0 and going to positive infinity. But what is my range? My range goes all the way down. Therefore, it's negative infinity. And if I zoomed out of this graph and I watched it go up and up and up and up, where is it going to? It's going to positive infinity. Wait a second. Let's look at that. Think about what your exponentials did and what your logs did. They're literally inverse. So the domain of an exponential was all reals. Therefore, our range is all reals with logs. The range on an exponential was restricted from 0 to positive infinity. But look at the domain on a log. It's also restricted from 0 to positive infinity. So you can actually see where those inverses are coming into play. We also have an intercept. We don't have a y-intercept because you can see that it's approaching but not touching. But I have an x-intercept at 1, 0. Wow. Wow, look at that. The x and y values are switched on our intercepts from exponents to logs. Same with our, our asymptote. We no longer have a um, vertical asymptote at y equals 0. Sorry, a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. Now we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, right, at that y-axis. And finally, we can talk about our end behavior. So my limit as x goes to... Uh, negative infinity and my limit as x goes to positive infinity is what we usually talk about with these n behaviors. But if you look at your graph, what's happening is x goes to negative infinity. Well, there is no negative infinity in this function. So it's actually not as x goes to negative infinity, but it's as x goes to zero. So for some time, for this, we are going to adjust. And now I know I've warned you before that n behaviors, you were typically talking about negative infinity and positive infinity. But sometimes you have to look at your graph and you have to identify 
Well, there is no negative infinity in this function. The domain doesn't exist there. Therefore, you're going to look at where you approach on that domain. Go to the end of the domain. So my limit as x approaches 0 is actually going to negative infinity. But as x goes to positive infinity, it's going to positive infinity. So it's kind of interesting to see as you look at the various um, changes between an exponential function and a logarithmic function. Oh, and increasing, decreasing. I forgot to write that one in. So my final one is if I look from left to right, what is it doing the whole time? It is increasing from zero to positive infinity. Okay. Now I've got a graph for you to do. Here is your you do. I have, uh, I thought I had a table written in for you. I'm so sorry. So what I would ask is that it, you plug it into a calculator, just graph it out, and then predict your key features and see if you can match it to your graph. Okay, so now let's move on to transformation of logs. And um, so I've got you a visual representation of what this looks like. So here is our shifting left and right. So this is that horizontal shift, or sorry, yeah, this is that horizontal shift. And as you can see, we are within parameters doing the opposite of what we assume. Hey, we saw that with exponents, didn't we? Here we have the horizontal shift outside of parameters. I'm saying this backwards, aren't I? This is horizontal. This is vertical, my bad, okay. So this is our vertical shift up and down, and this does exactly what we think it is gonna do. If it's positive, it's gonna go up. If it's negative, it's gonna go down, okay? Now we have our stretches and compressions. Um, here is a visual representation of that vertical stretch. So it's vertical, that means it's outside of that parameter, and it's gonna do um, what we think it's doing. A is big, so it's gonna stretch. A is small, so it's gonna compress. I don't have the horizontal on here, but I do have the um, visual representation of that reflection. So here, the negative is happening outside parameters. Therefore, it is vertical. Therefore, it's an x-axis. This is happening within parameters, so it's horizontal. So it is the y-axis. Here is that full recap, just like we did with exponentials. So here we go. Shift horizontally left or right. That is with, oh, sorry, <laughs> I want you to be able to predict this for yourself, but if you can't, if you have to wait for me, that's okay too. But this is within parameters, we do the opposite. So if it's a positive one, we go left. If it's a minus one, we go right. Shifting up and down, that's outside parameters. So if it's positive, you go up. If it's negative, you go down. A vertical stretch, so vertical means it's going to match outside parameters. And here you can see that that's the coefficient in front. It's going to do what you think it's going to do. So if it's a big number, it's going to stretch. If it's a small number, it's going to compress. That horizontal, however, is within parameters. And it's going to do the opposite of what you think. Uh, no, I lied. This is the one change. This is that one weird thing. This is where it's not going to do the opposite of what you think with transformations of logs. And finally, that reflection is going to do what you think over the x-axis is, um, sorry, over the x-axis is outside parameters because this is vertical, like our vertical shift, like our vertical stretch. And then over the y-axis is horizontal, just like our shifting horizontally left and right and our horizontal stretch. Just a recall of exponents. So you can actually see, ooh, you can actually compare them back and forth if you need to, to kind of see what's happening. I'd like you to take a moment, now that I've done some transformation work, I'd like you to take a moment to predict what you think this is going to do. This is a log of, in parameters, x plus 4. And my answer to this is that it's within parameters, therefore it's a horizontal, and it's going to move four units, but it's going to do the opposite of what I think, so it's actually going to move four units to the left. Here we have another one. Take a moment and predict what do you think it's going to do. Okay, so there is a negative on the outside that's outside parameters, so that means it's going to reflect over the x-axis. And there's nothing going on within parameters, but outside parameters, again, there's a negative 5. So this is going to shift vertically, so it's going to go down 5 units. Okay, again, take a moment, pause, predict what you think is going to happen. All right, so I have a 3 on the outside. So this means this is a vertical compression or shift. So what is it going to do? A is big. 3 is a big number. It's not one third. So it's going to expand by a factor of 3. Then I have within parameters a plus 2. So it's going to move 2 units, but which way? It's a horizontal shift because it's within parameters, and it's going to do the opposite of what I think, so left. And I think this is... 
I think this is my final example. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, so here we have LN. Does it change whether it's logs or LN? No, they're the same, just different bases. So this is going to be within parameters. So this is a shift left or right. And we're actually going to go right six units. Ah, we have more. Okay, so we have outside parameters. So this is a vertical uh, compression of one half. And then we have outside parameters, and it's going to shift down two units. I have a real-world example for us. The intensity level of a sound measured in decibels can be modeled by D of W is equal to 10 log of W over W naught, where W is the intensity of the sound in watts per second, or sorry, per square meter, and W naught is the constant, 1.0 times 10 to the negative 12 watts per square meter. We have four, eight, four questions to really answer this. It's kind of like a free response question. So I hope you persevere. I know you guys struggle with these questions, but persevere. Get through it with me. Okay. What's important? The intensity level. Oh, it's modeled by this equation. What else is important? That constant. That's pretty much all we really need from these examples. So here's my first question. Describe and analyze the end behavior of the graph of the function. So I highlighted end behavior because that's what it's asking me to figure out. Well, how would I figure out end behavior? That's pretty simple. I graph the function and I figure it out. So when I graphed it, you know, and I thought I had a photo of the graph, but I don't. I'm so sorry about that. When I graphed it, I ended up figuring out that the limit as w approaches infinity of d of w is equal to positive infinity. Now, why am I not looking at the left end? We have to think about this in the real world situation. This is the level of sound. So I'm not actually going to be worried about my negative values because there shouldn't be negative levels of sound. <laughs> so this, this, when you think about real world examples, when you put your answers, make sure you're not just answering all answers, but you're answering the question in the real world situation. Um, and what does this information mean? Because it wants us to analyze what this means. It implies that as the intensity of the sound increases, the decibel level, level is also increases. So as X increases, Y increases. That's what that's saying. But they want you to put it in terms of what they're talking about. So just make sure you're modeling that back. You're always connecting back to the information given. Here's my next question. If the intensity of the sound of a person talking loudly is 3.16 times 10 to the negative 8 watts per second, uh, per, sorry, watts per square meter. What is the intensity level of the sound in decibels? So what's important here? Let's highlight that. The intensity is 3.16, 10 to the negative 8. But what are we looking for? We're looking for the intensity level. So that's the original equation they gave us, right? So we plug in some important information. We would say our function is going to be equal to 10 log, right? Because that's the equation given to us, 10 log. And this W on top, that's what we're searching for. Where W is the intensity of sound, that's what we're looking for. So uh, over our W naught, this is the information given. 3.1. Oh, I got that backwards. My bad. Uh, let's go through this again. My bad. This is our W. This is our W naught. So that becomes 1.0 times 10 to the negative 12. Am I doing that backwards still? 3.16 times 10 to the negative 8 over 1.0 times 10 to the negative 12. See, it's important to double check, triple check, even in this question. I've done it already, and I'm still putting it down wrong. It's important to identify the parts of your equation. So this is W naught. It's important to know that this is our W. So I plugged that into a calculator and when I solved, I got an approximate 45. So that's my end answer. The intensity level of the sound in decibels is 45 decibels. Okay. Let's look at our third question. If the, the threshold of a hearing for a certain person with hearing loss is five decibels, will a sound with intensity level of 2.1 times 10 to the negative 12 watts per square meter be audible to that person? Hmm, that's an interesting question. And it's an important question, right? When we think about people with hearing loss or disabilities, we have to know that certain sounds can be heard, can't be heard. Like these, this is where real world examples actually can be used in the real world. They're not just made up examples in a textbook. So 
what's important. We know that the threshold is five decibels. We know that there's an intensity level of 2.1 times 10 to the negative 12 that we have to cross. So what are these point, what do these parts mean? Well, this five decibels is going to, um, is going to be kind of our, our, parameter for checking. So we're going to look at that later. That's going to be an aftermath thing. But this is important right here. This is our W. So I plug it in. D of W is equal to 10 log of 2.1 times 10 to the negative 12 over 1.0 times 10 to the negative 12. And I plug that into a calculator and I get an approximate 3.22. So now I told you we're going to come back and look at it. So is 3.22 decibels going to be loud enough for this person to hear? Well, if their minimum number of decimals to hear is five, then no. They're not going to be able to hear it. So that's my end sentence. Um, the s intensity sound or sound with intensity level of 2.1 times 10 to the negative 12 watts per square meter would not be audible to that person because it is a decibel reading of 3.22, which is below their threshold of 5. So here is my final question. Sounds in excess of 85 decibels can cause hearing damage. Determine the intensity of a sound with an intensity level of 85 decibels. Okay, so now we're actually looking at this a little different. So we are figuring out the intensity level. So what does that mean? That means we are searching for W. We are now solving for W. That means this 85 is my D of W. So I plug that in. 85 is now equal to log of W over 1.0 times 10 to the negative 12. And you solve for W, however you're gonna solve for it, whether you plug it into a solving solver in the calculator, whether you plug it into the graph and you find out um, where the original function and where 85 would correspond, it doesn't really matter how you solve it as long as you solve it some way. But then I discovered after doing that, that W was approximately 3.1623 times 10 to the negative four. And so that is the intensity level of sound, which you shouldn't be at, right? Because it says that's hearing damage. But that's pretty much it for our video today. So some closure here. We have, uh, we evaluated some logs. Then we talked about the fact that a log is an inverse. We looked at properties of logs and common logs, properties of natural logs. We graphed logs. We looked at their transformation. And then we talked about real world examples. I know it was a lot to take in. Um, and then we'll actually do lots of solves in the next couple of videos. But thank you so much. I'll see you guys in class.